I hope everybody's having a great weekend. I hope everybody's having a fantastic Sunday. It is amazing weather. Um, I was in the mountains yesterday morning, uh, and that was beautiful. Uh, amazing full of colors. The lights haven't fully turned, but they're getting there. Uh, I'd say next week, uh, it, should, it should be key. Next week, next 10 days, uh, we're going to see some real bright colors through the mountains. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and in town, it was just, it was splendid. I went for a walk, uh, saw great horned owls, got to see some amazing stuff. So got to love it. Um, and now winter. So again, I don't want to rush us through fall. I really, really, really want to keep establishing that autumn, fall are their own season unto themselves. There is stuff to be done. There is enjoyment to be had. Um, it's not summer, Halloween, Christmas, dreaded winter. That's not how the seasons work. There's a whole fall in there, you know, apple picking, uh, going to pumpkin patches, uh, finding new sweaters, uh, drinking pumpkin spice lattes, um, cider, like so much to do. So Brandy's just like, whoop. No, I'm like living my best life right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, planting tulips. Yay! <laughs> um, all kinds of good stuff. But we know winter is going to happen. So, uh, you know, winter could happen on a Monday and we'll be scrambling uh, to get you guys ready on a Sunday. So we're just going to give you uh, some points and tips now. Of course, Brandy is going to put it up uh, as a blog post, as a resource for you guys, um, and we'll be good to go. So, as per normal, uh, any questions, if I'm burning through uh, and there's a uh, problem with comprehension, uh, I'm not explaining myself properly, please, please, please uh, let Brandy know. We will go over it. Uh, we will make sure. And then if you have a specific question at the end, um what can i do with my junipers um ask me that at the end love to answer those so there'll always be time for uh questions at the end if it's comprehension uh you need us to kind of go over something a bit clearer feel free to jump in so uh the main part of uh closing uh your garden for the winter are your plant protection making sure uh your plants uh, have what they need to get through a harsh winter. Lawn protection, and lawn is, um, it's important. The great thing about lawns is relatively easy. Uh, lawns are kind of like, if you do some prep, leave them alone, they should be okay. Tool care, one that a lot of people miss. Uh, I can be bad for it, I absolutely can. I uh, get close to the end of the year, you're tired, you don't want to go outside, it's cold, you're like, eh, I'll deal with it in the spring. You got to pick it up in the spring and it's rusted, it's gross. Now you don't want to use it. Spring is busy. You got a whole other job. I thought I'd bring that up. And then some tips and tricks, things that I've seen in my landscaping, horticultural gardening career, things I've heard. Uh, maybe I can uh, help you guys, save you guys some effort. So without any further ado, let's get into plant protection. And plant protection. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is prepping for winter. So what we need to do uh, to make sure that the plants are in a good place to go in. Then we're going to talk about physical barriers. Actually, you know, think about it like a, a, a coat, a sweater, a hoodie is a physical barrier. Oh, it's cold in the morning. You put a coat on. OK, that's a physical barrier to protect you from the cold. Tying and staking, a bit of support. Think of that as like winter boots. Okay, you're not going to walk around in pumps. Well, I'm not going to walk around in pumps anyway. Uh, well, I might. I, if, I do have nice long legs. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, I can imagine you in pumps. Yeah, absolutely. I was wearing a, a beautiful apron last year. I'd wear pumps. Uh, I don't know how people do it, though. Oh, my God, your feet have got to hurt. I know, they do. Yeah, there you go. See? I, I honestly, I look at it, and I'm like, it's impressive you can keep your balance. And ouch. Yeah. Those are the two things. Yeah, but you, you you wouldn't wear them in the winter. Well, maybe you would. I don't know, but I wouldn't. So think about tying and staking as support. So think of it like a winter boot to a pump or a sneaker or something. And then mulching. Think of that as a cozy blanket hiding on the couch. So what we'll do is we'll go through them all. 
uh, kind of step by step um, and, and, you know, just kind of go over because I see a lot of people, um, they try to prep their garden for winter um, and they're setting it up to do worse. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll highlight them as we get to them. But when I see them and I'm like, oh no, like, please, please. I, I'm almost this tempted to go knock on doors and be like, what are you doing? But I don't wanna, I don't know if that's gonna offend somebody, if they're gonna be mad, they've done all that work. Maybe they don't know how to do it another way. Um, you know, but it, it, I see so many mistakes. So we're gonna hopefully clear that up. So the first thing, we already talked about this in the first one, cutting back. Make sure everything's cut back, everything's cleaned up, everything is as neat as you can get it. Get those perennials back, uh, broken branches on trees, uh, dead flowers, things like that. You might just wanna clean them off uh, and bring it back to a nice structure. So your perennials are down, trees are good. Well, again, we're not pruning them, we're just, we're cleaning them up, we're cutting back. And then the next thing is cleaning. Uh, get rid of those leaves. Um, get rid of those, uh, the, the debris, the branches, things that might garbage that might have came in. Um, we, we, we can't always do it. Sometimes, you know, bam, we get a snowstorm before we have a chance to go out and rake. Uh, it happens, you know, frequently. Um, and that can't be helped. There's nothing we can do. We have to deal with that in the spring. But if we're talking about what you can do to give yourself the best chance, uh, cleaning and raking are incredibly important. Um, getting those leaves up, because what will happen uh, a lot of times, and then we've talked about this, is uh, let's go to your lawn. Right? A lot of people have a tree in their lawn. The lawn's beneath the tree. It looks amazing. They love it. You get a bit of shade. Lawn looks great. All those leaves fall and they go onto your lawn. Okay. Now, some people say, oh, you can leave them. Some people say you clean them up. I'm in the clean them up camp. I'm going to talk about where to put them in a second. Uh, the reason I like to clean them up, um, especially here, is uh, with the Chinooks and the hot and the cold and they trap moisture uh, beneath them. But also the leaves come down and they fall on top of each other. Then rain gets on them and they get heavy. And now they're pushing your grass down. Um, maybe your grass isn't done. It might not be dormant yet. We might be having an amazing autumn. Uh, and now it's not able to photosynthesize properly. It's got this heavy weight crushing it down. Then we get a frost. Uh, the, the, the blade of grass has water in it. Now we get a frost and it's bent over or it's broken and that freezes. Well, now we've damaged all the tips. So if you can get out and clean and rake. The other thing is uh, around trees and shrubs, when I talk about cleaning out the leaves from around them, a lot of times we have problems in our gardens, uh, aphids, uh, rust, black spot, all kinds of stuff, and we leave those leaves. Um, well, the, the, the pathogen, uh, the bug, the whatever is living in those leaves in the spring as it warms up, you've, you've got it in your garden immediately to start infecting your garden. So if you have any kind of disease, get rid of them. Now, you might not have any, you're like, I know my garden is clean. I've done my best, a small amount, but that's going to be there every year. You're not too worried. You don't know. Maybe your neighbor's uh, trees were, were riddled with it and it's all blown into your yard. So that's, I personally like to clean and rake, but I'm not saying make your garden spotless. Find an area uh, down the side of your garage, down your fence, the back of a bed, something like that, where you can put a lot of these leaves uh, and a lot of these branches and debris um, for the bugs to overwinter, your ladybugs, your spiders, your centipedes, um, solitary bees, pollinators. They want somewhere to live. They need that protection and they'll find an amazing home in there. Then in the spring, you can gently pull it out and start composting it and get rid of it then. So I'm not saying your garden should be uh, pristine. You can eat supper off of it kind of thing. I'm just saying, have an area that you can naturalize, you can winterize, you can put stuff in, but around your shrubs, your perennials, your lawns, things that you're gonna put the time in, it's a good idea to keep them clean. Um, watering, another good, think of it like this, before you go to bed, a lot of people have a glass of water, right? You're thirsty, you're like, oh, I'm gonna to go to sleep for the night. You forget to have a glass of water, you wake up at two in the morning, you're like, oh, God, God. 
you're parched. Now, if you're a little kid, uh, you might need eight, nine, 12 glasses of water before bed because anything to stop from falling asleep. Harry was awesome at that. I need another glass of water. I need another glass of water. I drank too much water. But now I got to pee. <laughs> oh, so much fun. Um, but yeah, just like we need a glass of water before we go to sleep, the plants do as well. And I'm not saying you got to flood them. Uh, you certainly don't need to water uh, like we were doing when it was 37 degrees out, um, watering three times a day. Um, but you want to make sure that they have a good amount of water, that they've drank all they can. Either way, they're going to freeze with or without the water. Uh, that's not going to hurt them. It's going to percolate through the soil. Anything in a pot is done anyway, so you won't be watering your pots. So you want to make sure that they are well watered. I know a lot of people, again, they, they go, oh, it's autumn. Take the hose, put it away. And the plants are gasping for a drink. Like yesterday, I was out watering my garden. I'm still harvesting tomatoes. I got to get Brandy the picture. I have a pot this big. Uh, I got a 10 foot tall sunflower and the flower head is about this big and it's opening every day. Wow. Yeah. So we talked about that in the spring, growing in a small space and people didn't believe you could do a sunflower in a pot. So I did one uh, purely for that reason. So uh, watering, water right until you can't. Basically once that ground freezes uh, or you're getting really heavy frost, it's safe to start putting stuff away. And we're going to talk about that later on as well. Bleeding, great idea. Um, as you're pulling out your, your tomatoes and your annuals and you're cutting back your perennials, you're out there anyway. You see the weeds, get rid of them. Uh, clean them up. Add compost if you want. You do not have to. I don't. I have my compost in the spring. People like adding it now. Doesn't really make a difference. Um, I just, I don't see the point in putting it in. Uh, then it gets covered in snow. Either way, I've got to turn all of my soil uh, in the spring anyway, bring it all back up. I may as well put it in then so it goes in super fresh so nothing's depleted. Some people like to put it in now. Really, it's minuscule different. I was taught a certain way. Neither one is going to hurt. I like doing it my way. You like putting it in now, fill your boots. Not going to hurt anything. Turn the soil. Break that soil compaction up. Uh, a lot of times we don't get to it again at the end of the year. We all kind of slack off in the garden. I do 100%. Um, the soil can become compact from all the rain. We haven't turned it. Break that tension. Let a bit of gas exchange. Let that water that we're going to water get right in there. Uh, help get the weeds out so it doesn't hurt to turn the soil. So that's the best way um, you can prep uh, your beds going into the winter. And now, we're going to talk about the physical barriers. Uh, and these are the ones that I see people make the, the, the biggest mistakes on. And there's uh, the four biggest categories are snow fencing, burlapping, doing a tripod, or area marking. Okay. And some properties may have all four. Some properties may only have one. Some may have none. Um, there's, there's, there's no uh, right or wrong answer. It depends what you have around your garden, how much you get. If I don't really do an area marking on mine. Um, I do all my own uh, snow shoveling. I do all my own landscaping. I know where I, I don't care about my lawn. So I don't care if my, if my shovel hits my lawn. It doesn't, it's not going to break my heart. Um, however, I make very sure that my shovel doesn't go into my flower beds and damage my creeping time. Uh, I make sure it doesn't damage uh, my hens and chicks. So I know where my steps are and I know to stop that. If I was going to hire somebody to do that, I probably would pop markers and say shovel to that marker. So I don't do it because I know where they are. However, there's no right or wrong answer. So snow fencing. I think we've all seen snow fencing go up. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great product to put up. It's nice and narrow. Uh, it's relatively easy to use. It comes nice and coiled, and it's a great physical barrier. Um, it allows airflow. It's, it's, it's got slats. Uh, so especially in Calgary, Southern Alberta, where we get Chinooks, uh, allowing that airflow and that gas exchange to happen. Some days, uh, if, if anybody's tuning in who isn't from Calgary, you know, it's no exaggeration to say, you can leave the house and it can be minus 20 and by the afternoon it's plus 10 degrees um a 30 degree shift 
I know uh, people, some of them are very near and dear to me who suffer from migraines. And if you suffer from migraines, don't come to Calgary when there's a shootout happening. Uh, it's not pleasant. I don't suffer from migraines. Uh, so I quite enjoy the Chinooks, other than feeling bad for the people who do get migraines, but just don't tell me that much. Uh, um, I make sure they're okay, and then I run around in the 10 degrees and go, oh, it's spring. Um, <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly, because there's no ice. Uh, I don't know why I have to walk with a piece of pumps, but in my head, that's how I would walk if I was wearing pumps, so. I'm pretty sure they don't make pumps for size 12 feet, no. but we'll see. We'll see. Um, it dissuades rodents. So the slats are like this. Now, little mice are going to get in. That's why you might want to put up something like this. Uh, but the big jackrabbits can't get in. Uh, the deer can't get their head in. If it's far enough, if that's your tree there, you put your snow fence here, the deer can't get to the bark. Uh, the rabbits can't get to the bark. So depending on the problem you have might depend on the way you want to protect your tree. Prevent snow drift. A lot of times uh, where your house is positioned, some people get no snow drift. Others, it seems like every piece of snow builds up in the front of their property. You have a small tree or a shrub, it can actually bend over, it can break. This helps break it. The snow is accumulating on the snow fence and it's breaking up so it's not piling on your plant. Uh, lightweight, like I mentioned, you know, you, you got a piece like this, you can pick it up with one hand, you can play with it, it's super easy. Be careful of the root ball. People put this around trees. I always see it go in too close to the trees. If you put it down and you take your mallet and you're hammering it in and it's not going into the ground easy, you're either on a rock or you're on the root ball. Adjust it accordingly. If it's on a rock, move it back, move it in a little bit, you'll be fine. Keep an eye because I see people drive it into the root ball. You drive eight spikes into a root ball. Uh, again, you're doing more damage than good. Uh, you've just literally completely trashed a root ball. Now, the plant might come back, but you have hurt it significantly trying to protect it. So if you're not sure, just go a little bit wider. Go a little bit more than you think. That picture there, the reason I chose that picture on the slide is that's about as tight as I would want to go. Um, you want to give the plant room to move. So you don't want the plant like this wrapped tight. You want the plant to be able to move because if it's too tight and snow piles up on the top, I want that branch to go punk punk and drop the snow. I don't want it to go snap and then the snow fall off. So you want a bit of movement, but you want it secure so it can, it, it's got that way to wiggle and you don't want the fence. If the fence is a little bit out, you avoid the root ball and you give the plant room to move. Like my plant moving yeah, question. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at all these things. Are I know, <laughs> I know, right? Um, burlap, trusty, trusty burlap. Uh, great wind block. Um, it allows air through, but it cuts the cold. Um, again, same principle as us putting on a hoodie. You go out, uh, you know, let's say it's minus 10. You go out in a t-shirt, you're like, oh my God, this is cold. You put on a hoodie, you're like, well, it's still cool, but I'm more comfortable. The same thing, the difference is plants want to be cold. They need that period of dormancy. They don't want to be warm. We're going to be like, oh no, hoodie isn't good enough, toque jacket, hoodie, t-shirt. We're gonna layer up until we are warm and comfortable. The plants want it to be cold. They just might not want a minus 40 wind chill on them. That's where the burlap comes in. It helps cut that blowing ice. It helps cut that blowing frost, but it still allows the air circulation because it's breathable. The other thing about it too, it's aesthetically pleasing. When you're putting the burlap up, and I had somebody teach me this, uh, and it's always stayed with me. Uh, one of the best uh, ways to put it up, and especially if you're using a wooden stake like this, use a staple gun, okay? And the reason for that, you can pull it nice and tight. You can put a nice seam in it. Now, I know you can put it up like it is in that picture, and that looks great. However, you're gonna be looking at this for five months. And if it starts sagging or it looks old and it looks ratty, people are like, ugh, like it, it, it doesn't, I, I don't like it. 
if it's nice and tight and it's clean. Bill up in itself, it's a very, uh, we have people who buy this uh, to decorate for weddings or outdoor parties or uh, they use it to line baskets for photo shoots. It's a very aesthetically pleasing uh, fabric, uh, material, medium. Um, but you want to kind of keep it tight. When I see it and it looks like literally somebody just threw it on and left it, I'm just like, it's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, it's versatile, all those things I just mentioned. It's pretty durable. Uh, normally, it's not one and done. You'll, you'll probably get two or three seasons out of it. It will start breaking down because it gets wet, it dries, it's uh, exposed to UV, uh, it's exposed to a lot of bad stuff. It may even rip during the winter. But normally you can get two or three seasons out of your, uh, out of your burlap. And give room between the plant and the wrap. Again, I see people, if this is their plant, they take their burlap and they wrap it around directly. It's the same principle as when we put on a big coat or we put something like that on. You want to trap air in between the layers. That's what helps keep us warm. If you just, everything is skin tight and there's no air in there, you're gonna be colder than having one or two layers that have air and you trap thin layers of air in between your clothing, that's what keeps us warm. It's the same thing, you want that air, you don't want it pushed up right against, then there's no real wind block. The other thing is, if it is draped directly on the plant, and I see this all the time, can't say it enough, see people take that burn lap, and they literally wrap it around the juniper and you see the juniper poking out from everywhere. Well, all those tips are the new growth. That's, that's the needles and they're all gonna get burned. Then when you pull the burlap off in the spring, you're gonna damage the needles because a lot of times the needles are stuck to the burlap, they're frozen, they've been damaged, there's window damage. So you really, if you're gonna use burlap, that picture is a great way to do it. You can see this distance, not a ton of diff distance, but there's a few inches between the plant and the burlap um, to allow air circulation and the buds aren't sticking through. So that's the most important thing. Other great thing about burlap is, uh, again, with the staple gun, it works great with snow fence or with hard wooden stakes. Uh, one of my favorite uh, ways to protect my garden in the winter. And then next up is just a tripod. And a tripod is taking stakes like this, bigger ones if need be. They can be metal stakes, they can be bamboo, doesn't really matter. All you're doing here is building a physical barrier. It's gonna allow the air in, it's gonna allow rodents in, it's gonna allow deer in, there's really nothing there. What you're doing is you're putting a point uh, above a plant so anything coming down doesn't crush it. A lot of times, uh, you'll see people and they'll have uh, shrubs around the house in a flower bed, hydrangeas, roses, uh, spirea, pocatilla, whatever. The list goes on and on. Nine bark, nice and tall. Well, again, with our Chinooks, snow builds up, then it gets warm, and it slides off the roof. Comes straight down, hits the plant, and you just watch the plant go boom. It's broken, it's damaged. Now you've got to prune it in the spring, and you might be left with a shrub this tall, that was this tall. So you take your tripod, you build it around it. Uh, that snow comes down, well, it hits your tripod, it hits the peak and it breaks around it. So it's best to use because you're not really giving this no protection. You're not protecting from elements. Um, you're not protecting from uh, animals, deers, rodents, things like that. You're literally protecting from heavy stuff falling. Um, so really, I only recommend this on the hardy shrubs you have around your house. Don't, uh, don't put a tripod above a rose uh, in the middle of your bed away from anything heavy falling on it. You're not doing anything. You're not protecting the rose, and it's not going to break up anything falling on it. So um, that is purely a physical barrier, but it's a very important one. Um, see it all, all the time. Hydrangeas are probably the worst. People love them. Big flowers around the house. It looks amazing and they're just decimated every year with hard snowfall. And then next, papers are sticking together, there we go. Next is the area marking. And that can be done, you can buy the sticks, you can buy the ones that have got the reflectors, you can buy ones like this and some spray paint, put it in the ground and then spray paint the tops of them. 
anything to make it stand out. And basically, it's to prevent lawn damage and bed damage. Um, the amount of people that come up to us here uh, in the spring um, and they say, you know, oh, uh, my lawn, I've got an entire strip of my lawn uh, and it's dead and I don't know why. And I go, oh, is it next to your driveway? And they go, yeah, it runs right down my driveway. Uh, and I go, okay, how many times did you hit it with the shovel? And they're like, oh, and it, they immediately get it. You don't need to say much more than that. And they understand because you're shoveling and you go, wham, and you hit it, your lawn might be up like that or you've lifted those roots or your shovel skims across the top and you've damaged all of the crown of the grass and you kill that grass. And normally it's a strip this big, this big, down your sidewalk as well. Now, a lot of people do like the lawns uh, and that's why I always, I don't like lawns, but you guys should know uh, there's not one size fits all. If somebody comes up to me and they're like, how do I grow a lawn? I will tell you 100% how to do it. I know how to do it. I've done it numerous times. Lawns aren't my thing. I know some people who really don't enjoy trees. A lot of people don't like uh, flowers. Um, some people only want veggies. There's no right or wrong answer. So again, just because I joke around and say, I don't like lawns, I will make sure your lawn is the best. So you want to take these area markings and put them out. Then the best thing you can do when you go to shovel, instead of, you know, if this is the way your driveway is facing and this is your lawn, don't come in it like this. Line up with your area markings and do one running like that, one running like that, and then shovel like that. Give yourself a margin of error. Your grass will love it and you know exactly where to shovel to. Uh, they're really easy to install. You can see these ones that I grabbed, they've got pointy ends and all you do, if, if you're not strong enough, one person hold, one person hit. If you're strong enough, hold it, mallet, tap, 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 into the ground. Again, we're doing this before winter. This is prep. So we shouldn't have a ton of snow. Now, I recommend using these and not these simply because you may end up with a snow drift, but that looks pretty tall. By the time you put it in the ground, now it's only that tall. Then you get a snow drift and you've lost it. And you're like, oh man, I don't know where my stakes are. It sounds funny. It's literally happened to me. Uh, I share these things because I've either seen it or done it or both. Um, the longer ones are the better, especially as well if it's an area you're going to be shoveling. A small one, it looks great. You're like, oh, the snow won't get that big. Then you're shoveling and you're shoveling on top of it and you lose your markers. So it's always a good idea to have it a lightweight and use as many as needed. Uh, I see some people who do corner to corner. That's great if you can keep that straight line. Um, I know some people who do them every five feet. That's fine too. Maybe you need to uh, talk to your snow removal guy and say, where do you need them? Where do you need them so you're not hitting my lawn with your plow blade or your snow blower or things like that and work with people. But these come in really handy to mark flower beds, to mark your lawn, mark the end of your driveway. So you're not, and the other thing is, <laughs> I may not like my lawn, but you know what I really don't like? I really don't like when I'm out shoveling and I'm like, doing a good job, I'm doing a wham! And you hit something and your whole body stops and it's minus 30. That doesn't feel awesome. No. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not a time. Um, <laughs> and then I want to talk about tying and staking. So those were the, those were, you know, um, things that you can do, uh, like the physical barriers. And tying and staking also fits into the physical. It's not, you know, it, it's not doing huge snow fence and, and putting burlap out and stuff like that. A lot of this is individual. And the example I always use are junipers. And uh, junipers, they're amazing. They do great in Calgary. A lot of times they die uh, in the winter. They take damage in the winter. A few reasons for that. A lot of times they don't get the water they need before they go to sleep. People leave them, they dry out. A lot of times we have them at the edge of a property, kind of a shield, and they're exposed to a wind hitting them all the time. Some stakes and some burlap will help that out. Then they look amazing. You've got burlap in front of them. So now you're keeping the wind off them. You've got them protected. You watered them. Yay, yay, yay. Everything is great for you junipers. Then the snow hits them and their normal upright branches like this go, Ugh, and they fall down like that. And then they freeze, spring comes, and that's how they look split apart they might not be split they might not be damaged but they're bent they're awkward and you're like what can i do so you put a stake in nice sturdy stake 
and tie around it and keep them like that, you're going to do a lot to just keep them in shape. That's all you're doing is keeping them in shape. Now, uh, I don't have enough time to show how to do a running knot. And I looked on YouTube and I couldn't find a video. And I, I didn't have a lot of time. So I'm going to try and source a video. Uh, a running knot is the best. It's one continuous knot that goes all the way up the tree and you're just constantly snugging it. Uh, the, the image of the, of the evergreen tied there is somewhat of a running knot. Uh, it's an excessive running knot, but it is a running knot. If you don't know how to do a running knot, if you don't have the time, if knots aren't your thing, et cetera, et cetera, one stake, one around the middle, or one around the base, middle, top. If it's a bit bigger, do four. If it's a bit bigger still, do five. If it's in an area where it's going to get a lot of snow, do 10. It's not going to matter. A couple of things, you don't want to tie it tight. It's not like tying a shoelace where you want it secure. Again, you want movement. You're not going to lace it up. Then you're going to do damage. You're going to, those branches are going to be like, and you've cinched them. Uh, freeze thaw is going to happen. They're not going to be able to move properly. So you want them tied. You want them tight, but you don't want them cinched. You just want them tight and secure. You don't want to be like, I see people reefing on the knots like that. I'm like, I'm watching you hurt this tree before it's even winter. And then in the spring, they go, well, my ties didn't work. Look at all the dead branches. <laughs> no, your, your ties didn't work because you did it too tight. So ease off. It's like I say, you know, planting a tree. People put their boots to the soil to firm it down. Too much. It doesn't need it. You want to be firm, but you don't want to go overboard with things in gardens. It's, 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 you know, it's a learning process. It's like a delicate art, isn't it? It is. It's, it's knowing the difference because if you, yeah. if you make it too loose, you've done no good. Yeah. They're not going to either fall or when it splits, it'll, it'll snap, it'll break. You go too tight, you've damaged it. And it's finding that bump. You basically want it where you, you tie it and you feel it snug. That's it. That's it. Once you feel like tension on your tie, yes. that's it. I'm, yeah, I've I've seen I've seen people to use uh, a term loosely, professional landscapers yeah. tie it so tight the tree is trying to open, and their partner had to put their thumb so they could put another tie in it. Oh yeah. And I'm and I'm I'm watching and I'm just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And then and then yeah, I I see the tree in the spring and I'm just yeah. So. It's just learning uh, and figuring it out. And if you don't know, honestly, it's a good point, Brandy. If you're unsure, tie looser rather than tighter. If it falls off and a few branches come down, you know what? You can tie them up in the spring if they're not broken. Uh, fertilize, start getting that rigidity back. The sunlight will help it get back to being straight. If you've cinched it and cut off the circulation and it's dead, you can't bring that back. You can't bring that back. So if they've bowed out a little, but they're not snapped, they're not broken, and most of them won't. Most of them will have the flex. You should be okay. So if, if you're uncertain, always dial it back. Don't go overboard. And then mulching. Um, and it's, mulching is a great and easy way uh, to protect tender shrubs and new perennials. Any mulch will work. Um, if you go somewhere that's sold out of mulch and all they've got is a bright red one, use it. Compost it in the spring. Oh, Put it in your beds in the spring, whatever you want. Um, but it works. All you want to do for new perennials, just cover them, okay? Come up, I don't know, a few inches deeper than you would. You don't have to worry about it. Again, you're not going to be causing any fungus. We're going to clear it out in the spring. But all you're doing is you're just keeping that real hard ice and frost off the crown of a new perennial. It hasn't, maybe you planted it in September hasn't really established, it's still relatively new, needs a little bit of protection, doesn't hurt. The number one thing you see mulch roses. So you take it, you wanna pile it up, you, again, you don't wanna firm it in, you're not, you're not compressing it, you want it piled, you want it nice and loose and you want it breathable. Come up to about third half, you're protecting the crown, you don't wanna protect every single branch. I hear people go, well, I. I can't get mulch. I don't like mulch. I have some potting soil left over. Can I use that? I see people do it. Uh, you can. I don't recommend. The reason I don't recommend is mulch can get wet and dry out quickly. Uh, it allows air to get through it. Uh, soils, compost, and peat moss tend to be heavy, and they tend to stick. So they get wet. The snow hits. They absorb it. 
Now there's moisture sitting directly on the stem with no airflow because the soil is being compressed. Now it can't breathe. It starts warming up and that gas can't escape. So you've buried the crown of your plant uh, in organic material and now it can't breathe. And you're starting to build up uh, the chance of getting fungus in there, especially roses can be notoriously bad for rust, black spot, powdery mildew. You've trapped leaves under there and made a breeding ground for them. Uh, that's why I don't recommend using that. Just try and stick with mulch. Significantly better uh, for all those reasons. Now I see people uh, use leaves as well. Um, I knew a guy in Montreal only used leaves. Uh, and I could never understand why his roses always had powdery mildew. And I explained it to him and he was like, no, I don't think it's that. All right. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, so when they're doing mulch, does it have to be fine or can you use like bark chips? Like bigger you can use the bark chips. Uh, that's a great point. I don't call that's not mulch. It's bark chips. Oh, it is bark chips. Yeah. Oh, so so great point though, because again, so that's, that's a comprehension thing. So when I'm talking mulch, I'm talking a shredded mulch. You can see this one, it's fibrous, it's loose. The bark chips are like this. The reason I don't like using the bark chips, the exact opposite reason for the soil, the compost and the peat moss. You pile them, well, they don't mesh together. They don't hold like mulch. They'll, they'll, so there's big air pockets between them. So all the cold can rush in. You haven't really insulated. It's like putting on a jacket with three huge holes in it. Sure, you've done a bit of protection, but not really a lot. You're still going to be frigid. So that's why I don't recommend using the chips. And that's a great point, Brandy, because I don't consider chips mulch. Yeah. A lot of people will, yeah. uh, will make that mistake. And then the leaves, make sure they're clean. Uh, and you're going to need a snow fence or a chicken wire fence around when you put them in. Otherwise, they're all just going to blow away. Uh, I'm not a big fan of using leaves for those reasons. However, I would rather use leaves than soil or compost or bark chips. Uh, but a clean mulch, it's the way to go for me every time. Now your lawn. Uh, make sure your fall fertilizer has been applied. Now it's perfect, still warm enough, still enough uh, heat, put a bit of moisture, it's gonna break down, it's gonna help your lawn go dormant. Stay off the grass when it's frosty. You know what? Again, I don't care about my grass, so I love doing it. I love it when the grass is frosty and you walk across it and you hear it crunch and then you look behind and you can see your footprints. Yeah, the grass doesn't like that. The grass is like, no, this, this isn't awesome for me. It's awesome for me because I love it. I love that like you step on it and it kind of goes scrunch and you're like, yeah. Ah, it's, yeah. It's, and then you're like, and you, Everything's white, but your footprints are beautifully green and you're like deliberately trying to play. The grass hates that. Uh, oh. the, the crunch you're hearing is literally the grass blades breaking. Oh. Yeah. So uh, when you grass it now, if you have a hard frost, a light frost in the morning, by 10 o'clock, that frost is gone. Go ahead, walk on your grass. That's fine. It's when it's frosty, you want it to stop it. It's not after a frost, you can never go on your grass again. Don't do it when it's frosty, which is the most fun time to do I know. It. You can't have a nice day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's why. Don't care about your grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can have nice things. Uh, get your area markers out. Uh, again, the shoveling is a major reason people's lawns die. Apply your pest preventers. Um, and that might be uh, your plant skid, your uh, blood meal, anything that's going to keep those pests from getting into your uh, into your garden. Make sure your lawn is hydrated. Again, water. Don't want to flood it. You don't want a sprinkler running for six hours, but you want to make sure it has enough moisture to get through. Keep it clean. I already touched on that. Uh, get the debris. Uh, the oh, I thought somebody was right behind me. No, no, no. It was the plant. I heard a voice and I saw the plant in my. Uh, hey, 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 how are you doing? Uh, uh, make sure it's clean. Get the debris off it. Get the leaves off of it. Um, again, that's my choice. It's not everybody's, but I strongly recommend that. Uh, if seeding, apply the seed before the snow. If that sounds very obvious, the reason I bring it up is I see people, their intent is to put seed down before it snows. It snows and they run out and start throwing seed down. Uh, 
when the snow melts that it doesn't melt evenly the seed is going to be all over the place it may live but you're not getting that direct contact with soil it's it's not a good idea i personally don't see it in the fall again even if i'm looking after somebody else's lawn don't really see the point in it uh most of the times you're gonna have to seed in the spring anyway i like to do that in the spring but again uh that's a personal choice it's like adding the compost you absolutely can do it uh, it's a good idea to do it when you do your fertilizer um but that's a personal choice i don't i do mine in the spring if i'm doing it and stay off the lawn during the winter uh i know i saved it we almost lost something but oh my god that's it i'm leaving that on a high note we're done <laughs> uh every, if, you, if this is your first webinar every webinar something falls and i literally mean every webinar something falls that's the first one we've caught yes. pretty happy with that actually that's my high note of the day it's all downhill from here um i know in the winter a lot of times like you see people and they're very clearly taking shortcuts uh, the mailman might do it and stuff like that if you care about your lawn uh ask people to stay off it maybe you want to do a more physical barrier maybe you want to not use area markers maybe you want full snow fence so people can't step on your lawn because you have the weight of the snow then you start crunching it down then it warms up gets colder warms up gets colder more snow and you're just compacting ice on a pathway great might be a nice shortcut uh, there's a dog park i walk in every year in the spring the perimeter everybody walks in the winter is completely dead uh it comes back i mean weeds grow in there a bit of grass comes up wild prairie grass but the perimeter around it is dead because if it's not the snow gets up to your knees so some people have already walked it so i walk it and then the people behind me walk it and we all walk it so we have a good path the grass dies beneath it same thing is going to happen on your lawn so try and stay off your lawn uh in the winter and now the tools, and this is what I brought up. Uh, even I can be delinquent on this. I get it. It's, I'm making it sound like there is so much to be done. Um, a lot of times, most of this can be done in one afternoon. Um, and if you're unsure, as always, please, DM us, ask us. I will get on it. I will find better sources. I will explain it to you. We'll do everything we can. But the tools, a lot of times during the summer, we'll plant or in the spring, we plant, we put it away. We don't worry about it. We pull it out when we need it. We're done. We put it away. Uh, and you'll see them, and mine as well. I'm, I'm certainly no better than anybody else. Uh, they'll be caked in soil. Uh, they've got mud on them. Oh, I put them away wet. They've got a little bit of rust on them. My rake, all of the times on the end of my rake. Here, they've all got clumps of grass or leaves or whatever I've raked up branches woven through it and i'm just like oh i'm tired i raked i put my rake away and leave it at that so if it snows if it's cold you've done everything else you have a garage or maybe inside or maybe somewhere you can sit a shed uh not a bad afternoon to, to spend time with your tools uh and it's a good way to close the season out and be completely ready for the spring again spring is nearly always busier than the fall so it's good to do Get a hard wire brush, uh, same one that you'll clean a barbecue with, that kind of thing, and just buff all of your shovels. Get all the rust, um, all of the, you know, those clumps of soil, the clay, everything that's filled up, that thin veneer that you never got off, and just give them a good scraping and buff them up. Take a damp rag, you don't want it soaked, and just wipe them down. A dry rag, uh, if you want, just clean them, uh, dry them out. Uh, you shouldn't, they shouldn't be that wet. Uh, like I said, a damp rag, not a wet rag but buff them, get any of the dust off, anything left. There's a step I didn't put in there because not everybody does it. Uh, if you have a grinder, uh, it doesn't hurt to put a fresh edge on your tools, your shovels, uh, your garden forks, your edges. Not everybody has one. For the most part, most homeowners won't need to do that for how little you use your shovel. That's more a pro tip. If you have a landscaping crew and you're using your shovels eight hours a day, six days a week for seven months, they get dulled doesn't hurt to put a fresh edge on them. Uh, use vegetable oil and a paintbrush for the metal. Coat the metal, prevents it from rusting. I know some people who use engine oil, uh, it'll prevent rust. I don't, I don't wanna dig in my garden with, with motor oil uh, in the spring. I don't, I don't understand it. And these are gardeners, people are like, oh, it works amazing. 
So does vegetable oil. Uh, yeah. It probably came from the soil. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. So it makes sense. I, I, if you're using motor oil, if you want to use motor oil, apparently it works. You know, people who do it and, and they're rather successful, who am I to say, I just, I can't get my head around uh, putting motor oil into my garden by choice. So I, I won't do it. I use vegetable oil. You can use olive oil, seems rather expensive. You can use linseed oil, use horticulture oil. Uh, I recommend vegetable oil. It works great. It's the cheapest. Uh, that's no name, big jug, boom. There you go. You're away. If you still have wooden handle tools uh, instead of fiberglass, never a bad idea to take some sandpaper and just give the handles a once over, clean out any splinters, get them up, and then coat them with the oil. The wood will absorb it, especially in Calgary. The summer is so dry and so hot. Any moisture is pulled out. A bit of oil makes them nice and supple. When you store them, store them standing up or hang them. Try not to lie them down. Uh, they can start bowing under weight. Um, if you're lying them down on organic, like in your garden, maybe you don't have storage. Maybe they have to stay outside. Uh, again, they can freeze. You get a Chinook. It can just start causing a mess. It can start getting fungus on them. Always a good idea to hang them or store them standing up. It keeps them nice. And that's it. That's it. It's not a lot. It's, it's, it's really, you know, a good afternoon. When I was landscaping professionally, that was the last thing we do. We'd all get together at the shop. Uh, the last few people we had working, obviously we'd laid some staff off. It's the end of the year. And there'd be three or four of us. We'd all have our coffees. Uh, we'd have the radio. We'd be laughing and joking. And we'd just be cleaning and sharpening and putting away tools. And it's a good way to just kind of season it. My tool is clean. It's sharpened. It's put away. I'm not about to pull it out to go use it. There should be no reason. It's the last thing I've done. So a couple of tips and tricks here. Again, these are ones that I've learned. Uh, drain your water. Uh, fountains, bird baths, pumps, rain barrels. Um, if you can get them inside, get them inside. Cover them. Flip them upside down so moisture won't accumulate in them. Throw a tennis ball in. Tennis ball helps prevent it from freezing solid because it offers movement. It also gives the, uh, when it's freezing, it gives it something to compress against instead of outward on the item itself. But get that water out of them so they don't freeze. Remove nozzles from hoses. The amount of times I see people, uh, they take the hose and it's still got the hose gun on and they unscrew it from outside. They roll it up. Uh, they take it and they hang it up in the garage where it's not heated. Uh, then they go to get it in the spring and it's damaged because they didn't drain the head and water held there. And then the water froze and it split and it just caused a hairline split. Now you need a whole new gun or a hose or you got to do a hose repair. Take it off. Uh, it works. And then this is going to sound dumb. Uh, put your hose heads and your sprinklers in a bucket. Put them next to the hose. Amount of hose heads. I'm like, ah, I'll remember where that is. And then come the spring, I'm like, I'll buy another hose head, please, because I have no idea where. And then it comes July when I move something else I need. I'm like, that's my hose head. It's wonderful. Yeah. So uh, it's never a bad idea to put them in a bucket, put all your sprinklers together, leave them with your hose so you know where it is. But leave your hose, if you can, conveniently placed in case you need to grab it. If we get an extended Chinook uh, and you see plants waking up and starting to bud, but there's no moisture, you might need to give them a drink. Um, if you're having a uh, fire, it never hurts to keep a hose handy just in case. Same if you turn off your water to the outside, stop your outside faucet freezing, running, cracking, all of that good stuff. Let people know where it is. Uh, a lot of times I've gone to places in the spring um, and, uh, you know, when I'm landscaping and the husband or the wife aren't home and I speak to the husband or the wife who are home and I say, hey, we need your water on for outside. And they're like, I don't know where it is because the, the other spouse is the gardener and they turned it off. And you're like, Ugh. then you have to go into the house and you're looking for where the water and everybody's is different. You don't know. What, so it's always a good idea to let everybody know where that is. When the spring starts, you're not frantically looking for it. Uh, drain the fuel from any of your power tools. If you've got a gas mower, if you've got a gas trimmer, just drain it, drain the fuel line, let it sit empty. 
Uh, any mechanic will tell you, you don't want that gas sitting in there. You want to put fresh in in the spring. Uh, put away the summer supports. I've seen people that clean out their beds and they leave their tomorrow uh, rings out. Uh, well, they end up getting crushed with ice or snow hits them. Uh, they rust. You pick them up in the spring. You're like, oh, I, I, this is garbage now. All you have to do is stack it, put it away in the garage, shed, wherever, and they're good to go next year. Don't stack your pots. I see it happen all the time, especially ceramic and terracotta. Uh, you think they're good, you dump them, everything's good, they stack, looks awesome. There's a bit of moisture in them, they freeze or they stick together. Now you're trying to separate them in the spring, chances are something's getting broken or both of them are getting broken. Plastic can swell up. I see people trying to pull that plastic apart, the beating on them, anything to separate them. It's a good idea to not stack them. If you are going to stack them, put something in between so it's not terracotta on terracotta, plastic on plastic, um, some paper, a plastic bag from the mulch, something to stop them so when you go to separate them, you can, because not everybody has a ton of room. The only way you can stall them is to stack them, to try and keep them apart, and clean out your cold frames in your greenhouses. Uh, I see people who are like, oh, I'll get to that in the spring, the whole point of a cold frame in a greenhouse is to get an early start. You go in, you want to get everything in there. Well, it's still full from last year, but the ground's frozen still. And you can't get stuff out and it's a mess. And now you're trying to clean it and it ends up being uh, rather unpleasant. So clean them out as well. Uh, always a good one. And these are things that I've learned just from seeing that kind of general. So 